And P flow. Perfect. Well, let's kick off. Thank you so much, everyone, for coming to one of our later sessions in the day, but there's still plenty of people about, which is um, brilliant to see, um, with Terry Schultz, who um, I'm really, really excited to have a chat with, because <laughs> after reading your bio, Terry, it's been, um, it's really, really interesting, and you've done loads of stuff, so I'm sure I we'll have. get into that. Um, so this is one of our in conversation sessions. So we'll have a nice chat and then I've got some questions prepared. But if you guys have questions that pop up or you've got something in your head that you'd like to ask, do drop them in the chat and we can make sure we ask them. Or if for some reason you don't want everyone else seeing what you're asking, send them to me as a DM as well. Um, so I guess we will kick off. And then um, I guess the first thing to talk about is a bit about you, Terry, and um, I mean, you, like I say, you've done loads. You've reported from more than 30 countries. You've lived in Finland, Russia, Belgium, and grew up in the US. Um, and you've been based in Brussels since 20, ooh, 2006 even, current, and you're covering NATO and the European Union, which I imagine has been very quiet the last few years. Oh, sure. You guys have made it lively over there. <laughs> Do you want to kick us off by telling us a bit about what, what your, I was going to say, a day in the life is, but I imagine every day is different. You're exactly right. And that's what makes it so fun. First of all, thanks for having me. I'm, I it, honestly, it's, it's so interesting to talk to students. I really, um, when I was a, a, a journalism student, the most inspiring thing to me was of course not professors or, you know, people who read things out of books, but the people who came back and, uh, you know, and, and talk to us from the field. So I, I would love to teach one day, but I remember how boring it was to have people who didn't continue working. So I'm hoping at some point to become um, a professor of practice and still keep reporting so that I keep my finger on the pulse of reporting trends and um, which change all the time, I might point out. So now a day in the life. So I'm, I'm freelance, but I have two regular contacts for years and years now, and that's National Public Radio in the States. And for everybody who doesn't know, that's, that's like the BBC, funded differently, but operates much the same and a partner of BBC. And uh, Deutsche Welle, which is like the German BBC, sort of the German public broadcaster. And I work for the English service there. And um, I do television there and radio and online and social. Um, and for NPR, I do on, on air radio and um, online pieces more and more. They're doing, they're doing more in that. So basically, if I haven't already accepted an assignment for a day, I wake up, I ha also have two kids. So that's a bunch of drudgery. I'm just going to leave out of my daily, the daily schedule that I share with you. Um, but I wake up and I look at the headlines and as a freelancer, and I'm, I'm really happy to talk about freelancing because I've, I've made a career of it very successfully. Um, I wake up and I look at the headlines of the day. I mean, I do it while I'm still in bed. First of all, I, I turn on, I'm going to sound like a big advertisement for BBC, but I do while I'm still in bed. I always set my alarm for just a minute before the hour so I can catch the latest newscast. And I think that's really Really important because if I listened to either of the two organizations I work for, I already know that stuff. I'm the one providing those stories. I've got to find out what I'm missing. So I have to admit, I listen to the BBC many tops of the hours of most days. So I listen to them and I think, okay, do they have anything I need to follow as an EU or NATO correspondent? And then I scroll through my, my I mean, terrible life habits, right? I have no work-life balance, but I scroll through, you know, Twitter emails. Is there anything happening that I can attach myself to? Is there anything happening that I can pitch this morning? And so um, if there is, I write an email either to Washington DC, which is the headquarters of one of my, one of my clients or, um, or here in Brussels to the Brussels Bureau of Deutsche Villa and say, hey, I wanna do this. Can I do this? Do we have this? Um, and uh, yeah, then I get up and get the kids off to school and, and, and start my day. So on any day, I could be an online journalist, um, taking my own photos, grabbing my own audio, or I'm writing radio stories, or I'm doing TV stories, or I'm doing live shots from somewhere. So honestly, um, I've been doing this a few decades now, and I have to say that I don't, I don't ever wake up and dread my job. And for everybody going into journalism, um, I can only wish you the same type of career. I've never, I've never wanted to have any other career. That sounds incredible. And it's I fun. imagine it's, really it's exactly 
the it's kind so of job fun after all these years so much fun I imagine it's the kind of job that loads of people you know here today would love to have I mean how did how did you even start out on that course you said that you were a student journalist yourself so what well, of course what steps yeah. did you have to take to get into the position you're in now well, this is an, another thing that I often tell people because I'm from the middle of nowhere. I'm from New Mexico and I went to a state school. So, I mean, I didn't go to Harvard or Yale or any place that opens doors with the name of your university. Um, I paid for school myself. Um, many of you probably know how difficult that is, but fortunately at my university, uh, we had a television station with a live evening newscast, which was PBS, our national broadcaster. We also had two radio stations. We also had a newspaper. So um, I don't know how many of you are still in school or recent graduates, but if you're still in school, do everything, do everything you can at your school media, because I walked out of school um, of university with a tape of me anchoring live newscasts, a tape of packages of TV stories that I had done, um, radio anchoring, radio packages, uh, you know, newspaper articles. And that's what you have to do these days. I mean, the internet didn't exist, but um, you know, you have to walk out and look for any job there is because uh, in journalism, there are always going to be more graduates than there are jobs. And so I, I would just, I would just really encourage you to walk out and say, I can take a print job. I can take a radio job. I can take a TV job. I can take an online job. I can take a, you guys know social media so much better than I would. Um, and so much better than I did. Of course there wasn't any. Um, and so you've got to walk out and say, I can do that. And I will do that. That's the other thing. Um, so I, I come from the middle of nowhere with no doors opening myself. Um, and I was uh, how old? I was 21 when I graduated. And I, I took a, a backpacking trip to Europe like so many Americans do. Um, actually, so many Europeans do it too. But um, And then I was like, oh, I've got to be a European correspondent. I want to be a foreign correspondent. I knew nothing about Europe. I mean, really, really very little. Um, and, but then I was somehow sure that I would be able to find a job, which is really unrealistic when you're an American from the middle of nowhere. Um, but um, I, it took me a year. I started writing letters and again, sending out my tapes. Um, and, and so I could show them what I'd done. I would literally put tapes in an envelope and I sent them to, to European broadcasters all over the world. Back then there were more English language broadcasting, for example. Um, and I sent them all over and it took like six or eight months. And um, the Finnish broadcasting company called me and uh, I was waitressing with my university degree uh, because I couldn't find a job. And um, they called and said, do you want to move to Finland? And I'd never been there. And I'd been to Sweden. I'd been to Denmark on this backpacking trip. And I was like, well, it's got to be like Sweden. And how bad could that be? And I said, yes. And they hired me and I moved there. I was 22 years old, never been there not enough money in my pocket to fly home if I chickened out. Not even kidding, not exaggerating. I could not have flown back home. I only had enough to get there. And it turned into the most brilliant career move I ever could have made unknowingly because it was the end of 1989 and the wall fell, the Berlin wall fell that year. The Soviet Union fell after that. I was so young and so naive that I started just going into the Soviet Union because I didn't know any better. None of the Finnish journalists did it. Um, I mean, they did if they had to, but they didn't just wander over. And I did. I got a visa and I was there when tanks came rolling into the Baltics. And um, so I went and met the tanks and talked to people there. I mean, honestly, an open mind and being fearless is are going to be your best your best attributes. I mean, learn to be a good writer and then, you know, just be fearless and say yes to everything. And that's how I, I got to Europe the first time. And then I went back to the D.C. for nine years and then I'm back in Brussels for 15 I was going to say, I think that's such great advice because quite often, you know, I so I started in local papers and I would give out advice to say you, you, you should move anywhere in the country that there's Absolutely. a job. But it, it, you take it a step further and you say, actually, you should move anywhere in the world so that yeah. there could be a job for well, you. I had no language skills. I mean, I spoke Spanish being in New Mexico. We, I mean, we all spoke, took Spanish as our second language, um, but I certainly didn't speak German or Dutch or Finnish, for God's sake, or anything that would help me. And probably most of you do speak French or maybe German or something. I mean, the UK is at least one little step higher than us and the Americans on learning foreign languages, but it's really useful when you can say, I mean, and think about it, French opens all kinds of doors in Africa and Asia, you know, Dutch will do it in some places, German in some places. 
Um, but the, the important thing was, and when Jerry, as you were saying, when I was in university, there were towns that, that other students didn't want to go live in for the summer and work at. And I did. I took every single job I could. And I worked at, even when I was still in high school. So a teenager, a young teenager, 15, 16, I was working at my local town. My, I mean, my, my county newspaper and writing stories about cows and horses. I'm from a farm farming area. And, um, and I did that. And you have to just take the take the opportunities that, uh, that maybe don't look like they're golden on the outside, and they turn out to be and you get support when you go there and you go there with humility, and ability, you, uh, you get supporters for the rest of your life. I'm still in touch with those people who were my editors when I was 18 years old. And I said, please just teach me I'll do anything. And, um, and I did, and I still reflect on those lessons I learned at a tiny little town's newspaper, even now as I'm a television journalist covering the summits of the US and, and you know Russian leaders, I still needed those lessons of everyday journalism in a small place. Absolutely, absolutely. One of the key things that I think we picked up on um, from your bio is that you do a lot of different things. I know one of them is a podcast as okay. well. And I was yep. really interested to hear your thoughts on how important you think it is to have such an array of skills as, you know, as people on this call, as students now going into the career, how widely should they be casting their net on the skills that they can acquire? You, you all will have some skills I don't even have to this day. Um, I did when I was in school. We learned also how, so at my, um, at my university, uh, New Mexico State, which again, doesn't sound like a golden opportunity from the outside, but it was because of this TV station where we put out a live newscast, which was actually the regional television newscast. There was no other television station in my town. And so people watched us. So we learned how to edit one, you know, one day we would be the anchor. One day we would be a reporter. One day we would be a shooter. One day we would be a, a videotape editor. One day we would be, um, you know, the person, uh, the producer, the show producer, as we would call it, you know, deciding what goes first, what goes second. You had to do sports, you had to do weather. Um, I could not have made a living without that. I could not make a living now on any one skill. As a freelancer, especially, I mean, if you're lucky enough that you, well, I don't know if it's lucky, but you know, um, if that's what you want, if you, you know, decide you wanna be a newspaper reporter and you get a job at a newspaper and you never have to reinvent yourself, bully for you, you know, that's great, but that's not the life of most journalists these days. If I had to rely on any one skill, I would, live in a very small cardboard box with you know, my children eating noodles every night. Um, seriously, I could not earn a living like that. Um, and I wouldn't want to, it's so fun because there are some stories that only lend themselves to the printed word or the online word. There are some stories that you know, are just audio rich and you just think, oh, people have to hear this, not read it. You know, and the same with TV. There are some stories I can't do for TV because there are no pictures, but it's still a great story. So, um, and learn how to take pictures. A lot of online, you know, online gigs now also want you to provide your own photos. Um, so learn how to be competent taking photos. And I learned that at my first newspaper and we even had to develop them and everything. So I think really, I think your, your journalism programs now probably do a really good job of that. And you all, you guys probably can edit video really well. I can't do that online. I could, if I would just make myself learn it for a weekend, but um, you know, I don't know how to do Avid or, you know, uh, any of those, because I, once you get up to a certain level, you have other people do it for you. You know what I mean? I don't have to do it. I wouldn't be allowed to do it in, in, in some newsrooms. There are some newsrooms where everything's unionized. So you literally cannot edit tape because it's somebody else. It's not tape anymore. Um, but you know, I'm old. Um, there are some, you know, but now I have someone most of the time who can shoot video, who shoots video for me. I go out with a camera person. I then bring it back and I write the piece and somebody else edits it because I'm in a big enough newsroom. But starting out, you can't count on that. And I could do a lot more right now, even if I could do that. Um, and if I, I just, I don't have the need and I don't have the time to learn it well at the moment. But if I were just starting out, absolutely I would. And I keep thinking, I'm just going to take a week off and become competent at this so that I can pitch stories and say, I don't need anybody else. You can pitch stories on a different budget if you can do things yourself. You know, there, sometimes you'll get turned down for ideas because they don't want to pay for a camera person or don't want to pay for someone else to edit it. So um, you, again, you open up opportunities for yourself in the kinds of things you can pitch and the kinds of things you can deliver if you can do it all yourself. I think there's a lesson there as well in, um you know, not in like continual learning because, you know, it sounds like 
like from what you're saying you you kind of appreciate that Absolutely. there are always new skills to pick up yeah I taught myself radio when I moved here I was um, a television journalist and uh, I taught myself radio um, I mean I knew how to do radio from from university but you know things have changed then I did it was I'm not even going to tell you the technology because it's in a museum somewhere but um but like so I had to you know test audio programs. What do I want? Test microphones. What kind of mics do I like? I mean, now I do all my radio. I just filed two pieces two minutes before we came here. You know, I have my microphone here, um, tell my kids to be quiet and I plug it into my laptop, you know, and I track the pieces that I've sent away for editing. My scripts were sent away for editing for NPR and I just track a little, 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 really fast, email it off. And then, you know, joined, joined the call. So those are my, those are my days. Um, I'm tracking stories inside my car at soccer practice, you know, or whatever. And um, even before you have a family, you're going to want to be able to, to do that. You're going to want to be able to duck in somewhere and do your radio piece. And there's all kinds of technology now in audio programs. Um, you can capture audio right on your laptop. I mean, I can, I can, I have a programs now, I mean, that I've bought that I've, you know, adapted to over the years. I can probably record four different press conferences at the same time. Um, and with everything online, I mean, I hate COVID life as a journalist. Um, I, there's all, we can talk about that if you want. I think there's so many downfalls to it. But one of the advantages is with everything online, I can cover lots of things at one time simply by being really competent with um, online capture and, and audio programs. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. And I suppose one of the bits I was really interested in, because you're in Brussels now, is what is the big story for you at the moment? After you guys, um, <laughs> after Brexit? No, I, I wasn't, I'm not so much of a Brexit follower because I have colleagues in the German TV that do it. And, and in London, there's a bureau for NPR. So I do the U EU side of it. Uh, so I, what, I really, what I really like to cover, and this sounds odd, but I like to cover security and defense and war. Um, and I've gone to Afghanistan many times on my own. That's another thing about, about being fearless. Sometimes it looks reckless to other people. But uh, when I started covering um, Afghanistan, I, the first time I went was when I covered the State Department in the US. And I, I went in 2002 when the war just started. And since then, I've gone five more times um, and gone and uh, been with Afghan soldiers training and US soldiers and other soldiers, British soldiers, um, training Afghans and gone out on, on uh, patrols with them and, and done things that honestly, I feel, I feel really strongly that, um, and this is even more reinforced to me since we're all stuck at home often covering things, that you, you can't know enough if you don't go um, you need to be on the front line. I, I sat here because I cover NATO. I said and wrote, wrote about how the Afghan war is going or wrote about, you know, reactions in governments here. Um, even talking about sending back migrants to the, to the, to Afghanistan and things like this. And I don't, I don't feel like I can adequately talk about it or that I can, I should be trusted to talk about it if I don't go and see for myself. And so I've been all over that country. Um, I wanted to see how the war was going myself. Otherwise, also, honestly, the officials will tell you it's going great. It's going fine. Yeah, we're handing it over. Everything's fine. They're, you know, they can handle it. Um, and uh, yeah, I would have a bit different view having seen how things are going on the front line and having met friends, now, people who are now friends who live there, who tell me, you know, eyewitness, <laughs> have eyewitness accounts of how things are going. Um, don't trust anybody is another thing. <laughs> don't trust any one, one account of anything. Um, and report, uh, yeah, report fairly on all sides. But I feel really strongly that when you can, you go see it for yourself. And you will find when you get there, how surprised you are yourself at how different things feel and how much more you know when you come back and write about these things. And it simply can't be done remotely. I mean, really good journalism has to be done uh, firsthand. I really believe it. It's not always possible, but when you can go there, go there. That's really interesting. And I think, does that kind of, you know, because you cover a massive kind of area, does that matter so much? Is it, you know, the getting there? I imagine is you know a lot more difficult than jumping in the car and going to the next city but you're you're saying it's worth it basically well yeah and i mean to be honest a lot of what we cover in brussels um 
and it's harder to sell stories for me because they're less interesting when you're covering the policy making. And that's a lot of what I do and I like it. I'm so ashamed to admit that I really like diplomacy, which is, you know, one of those things that there's not good audio for and there's not good video for because there's just a handshake here and there. Um, I really like covering diplomacy, which is why I also need to write online stories because there's no, it's the best, uh, best way to describe it. Um, Brussels is not great for pictures or sound. Um, and that's why from here, what I cover is what the EU decides as a whole to implement in member states. When I can, I have, I get great joy out of going to a member state and looking at, you know, and bringing back the story when North Macedonia and Albania were, you know, set to be admitted or not as uh, aspirant members. I went to both of them. I said the, to the kids, this is what your Easter vacation is last year. I'm like, happy Easter. We're going to North Macedonia and Albania. And we did. Yeah, I'm a single, I'm divorced. So I have my two boys by myself. So anyway, that's what they get to do. We went to Kosovo on the side. Um, but I do those things. And I think you should do those things. So I, I do that. Um, I, a, lot of, a lot of what we cover here, you don't go there. But when you can, how interesting it is to follow a policy made here, you know, down the road from me and go see how it, it, how it turns out in member countries. And again, it's very different from what we think it looks like here. So no, I mean, if you cover Brussels, you mostly cover how the rules are made and you don't cover how the rules turn out in, in the member states. But when I can, I do. Yeah, absolutely. So I just want to remind people on the call to get your questions in on the chat. I have plenty, but I'm sure you also have plenty um, and I don't want to take up all of Terry's time. Um, but anyway. one of the bits I did want to ask you about is I saw that you were, um, you're on the Women in International Security. Yes um a committee a steering group yes. and that was really interesting to me because it does seem that it is an area of journalism that's quite male dominated is that is that fair to say still still so yeah women in international security also i'm the only journalist in that entire group um they are women who work at nato and work in think tanks and work at ngos and so I feel, I mean, I feel really privileged to be part, part of the group. They invited me to join. I've, I've covered them. I followed them. Um, they do lots of events. I would really encourage any young women who want to cover security issues, who get into security and defense like I do, uh, national security, cybersecurity, to look at WISE has a fantastic chapter in the UK. Um, and, and it's a great place to make contacts and um and there's, they have just tons of events and we do a lot of online stuff and you get to meet like real people that are very high up in the field, um, sort of as peers. Uh, and I would really recommend joining, joining them if you, if you can. So yeah, so I mean, even after all these years, uh, on calls at, at, for example, at NATO, the, the core group of journalists who, um, who get invited, there's not very many of us, like five or six of us who get invited to these small, um, really uh, the high level talks with ambassadors or even the secretary general or um, things like this, the rest of them are men. I am the only one, sometimes I'll take screenshots just to remind myself, I am the only woman and that's crazy. I mean, in a wider press conference, there will be women, but uh, it just, um, of, I mean, most of them probably aren't, of, I mean, but my generation, it's, it's because, I mean, the, the people who pursued those careers at the media organizations were men. And there are women, there are women in Kabul, there are women bureau chiefs of, of Western news organizations. And, um, but I, I just can't believe it that, you know, the diplomatic correspondents for the newspapers are men. And the, you know, the people covering NATO are men and it should not be that way. And I plead with you, young women to steal this field. It's so interesting. It's so interesting. Um, and we're just squeezed out. And when I first moved here all those years ago, um, I kept reading my colleagues having like special tidbits in their stories. And I was like, where are they getting those? And I wasn't invited. I wasn't invited. Part of it was probably because I was a freelancer and they were, you know, the editor of the Financial Times and, you know, the correspondent of the Wall Street Journal and these kind of people. But I started calling up the, I could figure out where it came from. And I would call up and I would say, why are you not inviting me? And please do this. I mean, not just for women, but when, whenever you as a journalist are, are excluded, call up and say, hey, I represent a readership too. I represent an audience too. Why are you not inviting me? Um, and as long as you are of, you are a high quality journalist and you very, very, very seriously um, adhere to the rules about 
when things are off the record, when things are on background, and you make sure that you double check those rules all the time and you never break that, um, you will start gradually being invited to, you know, places where you find out more than you would otherwise. But your standards have to be really high. Your principles have to be, you know, unbreakable. Um, because otherwise people aren't going to tell you things and your reputation will be ruined forever. But so gradually, yeah, now I'm the, I'm the one that gets invited to everything um, because other people sort of moved away and I just stayed. Um, but yeah, I get invited. I get invited to everything. I get, if I want to ask a question at the press conferences, I will get to because, because I've been here the longest, but also because I really put in the time on my beat. I go to all the background briefings. I send questions. I, uh, call people and ask for background uh, when I don't understand something or I ask for what's coming up and I break a lot of news on, on, on this and um, you know I have a lot of a lot of Twitter followers that follow me just because of NATO um, just because of defense stuff and um, I mean it's just it, it it takes a lot of time but it's worth the investment if you want to make a name for yourself and a reputation for yourself yeah absolutely absolutely and I think one of the areas that is very topical right now that you focus on is disinformation isn't it and yep. I, I guess I'm interested in how you've seen that change kind of in, in the COVID world as well because it seems like it's exploded even more. Sorry I have a, <laughs> a visitor. It's oh, She's always like oh, like I'm a witch with her on my shoulder. Um, she's very old too. Um, yeah so disinformation I mean I like to tell people that my first real um, my first real uh, interaction with disinformation was back then when I was covering the Soviet Union and I was there during um, during a particularly bad time and and the Russians cut I was in Estonia and they cut off all the phone lines so I'm staying in a hotel and you suddenly don't have a phone and there's nothing on TV so when they didn't want you to know things or they wanted to to you to think something else um, they would just cut off the means back then it was easy compared to now of course it's very hard to shut down the internet but um what i uh, covering in both nato and the eu are the target of a huge number of of cyber attacks every single day dozens or hundreds or i don't know what the number is but tons and uh, uh, some of them are effective i mean they shut down um for example like last week the belgian parliament was supposed to have a discussion on uyghurs on, um, you know, uh, I don't know if it was all the way to whether, you know, the treatment of the Uyghurs is genocide, but it was about, you know, should we or should we not, I think, um, import products from China that may have been made by Uyghur labor. And, um, and gee, they, the parliament got shut down by a cyber attack. You know what I mean? Because they didn't want this kind of information getting out. So now I, I, um, I got to cover the European parliament elections, um, Two, God, two years ago almost now, um, when all the countries were going to vote on the same day, uh, or same, it was like two or three days, and there was just this huge disinformation um, campaign. And, and I mean, I don't think anyone should shy away from saying that most of it comes from Russia. It comes from, uh, or if the actors themselves don't come from Russia, they are funding far right movements um, and troll movements to try to really throw a wrench in everything the European Union does. Um, and, and increasingly China too. And, and that, that was true of, of um, and Iran to, to some extent. Uh, and that, that was true before, before COVID. And now of course you saw it, both Russia and Chinese influence, um, efforts to influence anyway, the COVID narratives um, come front and center. I mean, they were openly doing it. Um, you know, trying to send um, goods that, uh, you know, weren't really useful, but then putting out all over Twitter and all over social media, how they were helping Italy when the Italian government wasn't. And, you know, to some extent, that was the EU's own fault because it wasn't stepping up fast enough. So um, leaders just have to remember, I think, that if you leave a gap, someone will step in and the story they tell about you will not be the one that you want told. So um, I now um, am part of a, a journalism run NGO here in, here in Brussels um, that's spreading and in fact, it's, I think it's going to start, come to the UK eventually, where we, we teach that it's all journalists um, taking time out of their otherwise, out of their regular jobs to teach students as young as 11 and 12 how to spot 
um, fake news stories, how to how to make good decisions about whether they forward things that they're getting on WhatsApp groups or that they see on social media or they see on TikTok, you know, whether to forward those. Um, how to even teach their grandparents who are that that's the age group that forwards the most um, fake news stories, how to, to have talks with their grandparents about not sending stories that they haven't checked out. Um, so I really like doing that. So we do classes of 11 and 12 year olds and classes of 15 and 16 year olds. And I have to say that the 11, the 11 and 12 year olds are the ones who are most receptive to this 15 and 16 year olds. I have a 16 year old. They already like don't want to listen to anything we say. So um, yeah, it's, it's, it's fun to do that. And it makes me feel like maybe I'm making a little tiny drop in that ocean of consumers who don't care about spreading disinformation, which is really disappointing when you're a journalist who works really hard to check all your facts and put out a story. It's never going to sound as sexy as a story with a bunch of made up stuff in it. So I think that's a really big challenge for your generation. I don't know what you're going to do, but I mean, I think that you have to start with it with... <sighs> I mean, we can only do so much from our side, but I think that that um, equipping consumers with the willpower and the capabilities to detect when things are not true um, is going to be really important for for people your age. It's a massive challenge. Absolutely. Oh, it's huge. It's just overwhelming. Honestly, it's so depressing when you think about it. When I think about the people, I work for such good, reputable news organizations and people would rather read, you know, bullshit. I, I you know, it's, it's really depressing. Yeah. I'm just grateful I still get paid to do the real stuff. You know what I mean? I, I worry when we lose that battle. Yeah, absolutely. Um, we've got some questions coming on the chat, which is uh, great news. Um, what is the best story that you've ever worked on, whether that's kind of the most rewarding or the most exciting? Oh, gosh. Oh, my <laughs> that's God. That's a big one. <laughs> um, but I don't know why that stumps me. Um, like the story I liked best or I don't know god oh my god I can't believe I can't think I do so many because things because you've done so much right so <laughs> funny I don't know I've never thought about it I've never narrowed it down um or is there one I guess that kind of sticks with you all this time later maybe something yeah, that lots of them do lots of them do for different reasons sometimes it's because they broke your heart when you wrote them you know what I mean or you felt like people cared well I mean I don't know I've had oh god I've been doing this you guys I've been doing this since before you were born so get, forgive me for not being able to think back all the way um I think um well this one was fun and I loved it um it, it's recent but um you know, maybe not the most internationally impactful, but um, one story I did. Okay, so I lived in Finland for eight years and I speak Finnish um, and I got my master's there. So I'm very, very fond of Finland and, and they do so many things well and they're so quirky and then, you know, it's so small. And anytime I can do a story in Finland, I'm, I love it. Um, so Finland had these, um, was the first country to start testing um, dogs that could sniff out coronavirus. Um, and they put them at the airport and I got to go up there and, and um, just last year and, and meet these people who were doing this basically as volunteers um, to, to train these dogs to try to, you know, stop people from having to have the really invasive tests. And that story just went, went viral and um, about the dogs who could sniff out Corona. And it was really fun and it turned out really pretty, you know, just like the, it edited together well. And, and that was really fun. And I was really, I really liked sharing that story with people. Um, another story I did that I think really was, um, it was probably the most emotionally gripping story for me and for other people because everybody who watched it cried. Um, pretty much my colleagues were all crying. So I, um, I was asked to do a story like come up with something. This was back when the world, um, the entire world, um, it was the one millionth death from COVID. I mean, which is just a horrible story to be assigned. And they're like, okay, come up with a story for that. And I'm like, oh God, who wants to talk about that, you know? Um, and I looked here in Belgium uh, to what, you know, what could I, what could I do? How could I tell that in a, in a sensitive way, in a way that doesn't bore people in a way that's not just about the numbers. And I mean, sometimes it's, it's really exhausting to try to think of these things and you just don't know where you're going to get that inspiration. And I was just like sitting watching local TV and I saw this, um, I saw um, 
a local memorial service um, for it's like an hour away, a town an hour away. And um, I just happened to catch this boy, this very young boy, um, giving a speech in Dutch because it was in the Dutch speaking part of Belgium um, to his grandfather. You could tell, I mean, I speak, I don't speak Dutch, but I understand enough Dutch that I could tell he was giving, he, he was, he was telling a story about his grandfather there. And you could see that, you know, just everybody was in tears and I was almost in tears, not even understanding his exact words, but he was just this brave little boy. And I thought, wow, I wonder if there's a way for me to tell the story through him. So I saw it on TV. So I just started um, looking at his name was on there. Um, and uh, then the local TV interviewed his mom. So thank God I had more names and I'm scribbling them down. And I, you know, um, then I started looking for them on social media and this is what you do. You see, okay, is she on LinkedIn? Is she on Facebook? Is So I looked and she's on Facebook, but then of course you don't know if they're going to think you're some freak, you know, stalking them. And I wrote her a note on Facebook. Um, and uh, luckily, um, so this is, I don't know if this is a tip that will, will help you, but it, it's something that has helped me. So I leave my Facebook open, uh, public, um, even with posts about my kids and stuff like that. Um, I put stories on there sometimes. I talk about my mom. I talk about my kids, you know, um, because that makes me a, a real person. Like it, people look at it and they're like, okay, she's not a freak. You know what I mean? She's just a normal, overworked, boring mom. So um she looked, so I wrote her and she didn't write back right away. And I was just like, God, what if I, you know, I hope I can talk to them. And um, she, then she wrote me, she looked at my face. She told me later, she looked at my Facebook page. She saw, okay, she looks like a pretty normal person. And she wrote me back and she said, sure. Yeah, that was my dad who died. And that was my son talking. And, um, and yeah, you can, you can come and talk to us. And so I wrote this story and um, it, he ended up this kid. I don't know how, because well, because I have kids, my expectations were low. <laughs> he spoke, he's this Dutch speaking kid, never studied English. He spoke almost perfect English because he plays with his PS4 <laughs> so much. Um, and this, so I find this little boy who speaks almost perfect English and he can talk, talk to me about the death of his grandfather who he spent every day with after school and just was this heart wrenching story. And he spoke to me in English and he spoke to me about how afraid he was to give that speech because he thought people would laugh at him. And, and then finally they convinced him. And, you know, it was this beautiful, amazing story. And it, that was probably the best. I wouldn't, I mean, maybe that's not my favorite story, but you know what, that's probably the best story I ever did. That was uh, about a year ago. Um, and uh, everybody who watched it because I left the little boy, I don't have a stand up in it. Um, you can hear me talking to him. Like how old is he? He's like eight, you know? And, um, and I'm talking to him, or maybe he was, was he 10? Um, and I'm talking to him and he's telling me in English, I was afraid, I was afraid they would laugh at me. And then, you know, my grandma said, can you just do it for grandpa? Just go and tell them about your grandpa. And he's like, yeah, I can do it for grandpa. And then he, he said, as I was standing up there, you know, I was like, well, nobody laughed at you. Every, every, what did you think, you know, about yourself when you're standing up there? And he said, I thought I was really brave, you know? And he's telling me this amazing story about this horrible loss and, Meanwhile, everybody watching my story just cried because he was so, I've got to plug in my computer. Um, he, he was just so heart wrenching. Um, and when you can let, when you don't have to tell the story and so, you know, the person that you manage to find who tells the story for you, those are the most beautiful stories you can do, especially when it's somebody like a little boy, you know, and, um, yeah, that was, I'm glad you made me think about it. I, that was, that was certainly the story that people told me um, impacted them the most. Oh my God, you're gonna make me cry, let alone anyone oh else. My, that story is so beautiful, no credit to myself, but I have editing and it has music in it and it's really so lovely. It's like, yeah, I yeah, it. absolutely. Um, so we do have some more questions as well in the chat. Okay. Um, do you think that it's harder now to send white, especially female journalists to war zones or will employers still send you there regardless of um, your gender or your race if you're good enough? Okay, I don't know if, if there's a difference between white females and other females, um, and it's even not about females. Um, so let me tell you the terrible story about being a freelancer and um, going to a war zone. So if you're gonna go to a war, so, um, and even, even staff now. So, um, if you're a freelancer going to a war zone, I will tell you some things that will shock you. Um, your insurance, your, your health insurance won't cover you. Okay. So when you 
decide that you're going to go there. You have no coverage if you don't work for a news organization. Um, and if you're a freelancer, a news organization will not send you most of the time because they cannot insure you. They don't have you covered under insurance. And if something happens to you there, they are responsible. And this, this changed over the course of the war and I saw it change. So initially they sent freelancers there and people would get wounded, including grievously wounded and need, you know, a thousand surgeries. And I'm speaking for Americans now um, and need healthcare the rest of your life. And they would have to pay out of pocket. And the news organization, you know, in the US that is, you know, that's something that could <laughs> make you go bankrupt. So, um, they not only would my clients not send me there and not ask me to go there, but they would not even promise to buy a single story if I went there. Because if an email existed in which they said, yes, we want a story from there and something happened to me, that could be constituted as a contract and they could then be responsible for my well-being. Okay, so no, they won't send me there. Uh, and they won't promise me anything. Once I get there and I'm like, I'm okay, they'll buy things from me when I get there. It is horrible. It's horrible. So I'm going there preparing to earn zero and risk my life. Two of my colleagues from NPR got killed by the Taliban um, a few years ago. I haven't gone back since 2015 because now it's too dangerous. So I, not only that, but so then you also have to sign forms from the military that says, um, if you get blown up, we're not even responsible for repatriating your remains. So you have to be prepared to sign something saying, maybe, you know, nothing will come back of me. They won't, they are not responsible for doing anything to save me, give me medical care, nothing. So when you go there, you have zero support. Some news organizations, I don't know, maybe some European news organizations still have a way to get insurance on you, but I don't think so. I don't think so when you're going to a place like that. It is so dangerous now that you can't even drive down the street. Back then, there used to be fewer random bombings in the streets. Now, I mean, honestly, today, a girl's school got bombed. Um, you know, I honestly, I don't suggest you go there now. I, I went and every time I thought, am I rolling the dice? You know, one time too many. And, and now I'm a, I'm a divorced and I'm a single parent. I, I can't go now. My kids got old enough so that they knew it was dangerous and they got scared. When I was, when they were younger, they would just ask, oh, what helicopters did you ride in? And things like that. And I would be like, oh, look, I rode in this helicopter. I rode in, the, you know, I got to do this. And they were like, oh, that's cool. Now, th then once they got to be old enough to understand um, that my life was in danger, I, it was too much. It was, it was not psychologically responsible to go. Um, it's so dangerous now. So the other thing is that, so I'm not sure that Europeans would send you either. So my European, my, one of my German colleagues who was going with me on one trip to Kabul, he had to sign something saying <laughs> that if he got kidnapped, he was on staff, that if he got kidnapped, he would not collect his per diem for the time that he was held. Like, because, you know, people who were journalists were getting kidnapped and held for years. So you had to say, okay, if I get kidnapped, you don't have to pay my per diem. Like, seriously? I mean, honestly, isn't that crazy? So yeah, I mean, all the odds have been stacked against us going there for years and years, and yet some people still do it. And if I wasn't a parent, I think I would still go because I love that country. The story needs to be told, you know, and I'm a little reckless that way. I would go, but not, I've got a 12 year old and a 16 year old and you know, they need me and I can't go. Um, so I guess that was going to be my follow-up question to that, actually. After all you've said there about it being really dangerous and stuff like that, then why, why do people still go? You'll understand when you get bitten by the bug more once you're out of school. I mean, I, would, I guess I, I wouldn't have known at your age either that how much some things grab you. Some things grab you and you won't be able to stay away. <laughs> Um, I would say that about the entire industry for me, because most people by my age, I will just tell you all I'm 54 and I've done this and nothing but this. Um, and most people by my age long ago left for something better paid with better hours. I get paid very little. Um, I, some of the stories I filed from Afghanistan are $50 before taxes. Wow. Okay, would you go risk your life for $50 before taxes? 
and I do, and I do. So yeah, um, it's not explainable. It's not rational. Um, it's something that grabs you and doesn't let go. And I dream all the time about going back there all the time. Yeah. And I, I've gone to other dangerous places. If there are terrorism attacks, I'm in the middle of them. 9-11, which you mentioned, you guys mentioned in the tweet, uh, when the Pentagon got hit and I lived in DC a couple miles from there, I ran downtown as fast as I could to cover it. Um, I don't know. There's something, um, and thank God journalists do it. Otherwise, we'd, we'd never have any idea. Thank God there are some people like me, um, stupid enough to run towards the fire always. I would never run away from something happening. I don't know why. I run towards it. Um, so it's probably a death wish. Um, so I'll get my kids up and in university, and then um, I'll get to go do more stuff. I don't know what, I don't know how to explain it, but I'm not the only one. Absolutely. I don't know. Absolutely. I so I'm conscious that we've only got a few minutes left. So I guess um, for our kind of last question, if if our members have sat here today and listened to you and thought, wow, that's that's the career I want, what would be your, I guess, so. <laughs> the, your, the, your, I, Does I don't anybody know. have hands? Can I see? Does anybody, are you, can I see the gallery? Let me see. Can I see any, can you guys, who want, do, do I make you want to do it or not want to do it? Put up your hands if you want to be a journalist, if you want to do this, if you want to have this crazy, wonderful, always different, never reliable, but never boring life. Show me your hands. If you We've, still got hands. Hands. We've got hands. We've got hands. Yes. You've got to do it. You've got to do it. Some of us still have to do this, guys. Some of us still have to do this. And I guarantee, I mean, you'll never be bored. And your wits will always have to be sharp. And sometimes that's bloody exhausting. Oh my God. I lay on my bed, on my couch at night. I'm just like, I can't even walk upstairs. Um, but it keeps you really, well, I don't know. I'm not going to have you judge my face, but it keeps you young mentally. I mean, people my age are already like grandmas and stuff and like, you know, and I'm just like, God, when can I? when can I go back to Kabul? You know, it, it gives you some kind of an age defying brain because you're constantly looking for the next adventure. Um, and okay. Most of us don't stay married. I think, I don't know the statistics on that. It's very hard to be married to a journalist. Um, it's, it's, um, but I don't know. It's a, it's a, I wouldn't trade it for anything. I wouldn't trade it for anything. And there've been moments when I was like, don't I just want a paycheck? You know, don't I want to be able to start at nine and end at five and not work weekends and not be constantly thinking, oh my God, do I need to update that story? You know what I mean? But no, the answer is no. I know, and I don't know anybody who, has, who enjoys their career as much as I, as I enjoy mine. Um, I would like to go back into a staff job. So this is one thing that now I've been on my own for so long and, you know, every morning having to see, do I earn any money today or whatever? I, I earn plenty of money now because I have such a reputation. I get asked to do all kinds of things that they pay me a lot of money, um, like uh, hosting conferences and giving talks and this kind of stuff. And, and um, now I have a reputation um, because of all, I've done all these crazy things that, you know, people want to hear about it. Um, or they want they want me to talk about counter disinformation or they want to want me to talk about nato and and you know thank goodness and and i would really recommend specializing in something like i said i got my masters at the university of helsinki so i already stick out like they're like okay she does odd things <laughs> and um you know she learns things that other people don't know um do that make yourself a specialty in some some field or some place um, that other people don't have because you've got to make yourself stand out. So I still would say, okay, my advice would be uh, look for what I did at, at 22. I moved to Finland. I couldn't have known because I was too naive. I didn't know what a great move that would be. But if you can look around the world and find a place where you can find a job, especially at your ages, you've got nothing to lose, nothing. Um, look for, I like, if I were starting out now, I would look for like, there are English speaking, English speaking newspapers in places like Cambodia you know, or Sri Lanka, or there are radio stations. I did a training for a week at a radio station in rural Zambia. Like it took four hours to drive into the bush from the nearest airport just to get to this tiny little radio station. And I got to go there for a week and teach them radio. Like look for those opportunities to go there and be different. Don't look like everybody else. Don't just look for your, you know, I'm not saying if, if you if you fall in love with your hometown paper and you want to stay there, 
that can bring you all the happiness in the world. That's really, that's really a community service. But if you don't want to do that, look for the craziest place that everybody else wouldn't think of going and go there and become an expert there. Expertise in anything brings you respect. And you know, you just don't know when something is going to happen in that place. And you're like, you know what? I'm there. I can report on that BBC. I can report on that ITN. I can report on that. You know what I mean? You're there and nobody else is there. That's what happened to me in Finland. There was literally not another English speaking foreign journalist there. Just me. Um, and so, I mean, there were a couple of wire reporters, but nobody doing broadcasting, for example, learn how to make your stories yourself, learn to be, I have this little MacBook here and I am completely self-contained here. I can do live shots. I can do, um, all my radio work. I can upload my photos. I can do everything, become a one person bureau and then go somewhere wild. I mean, that's what I would say. That's fun. And you know what? Maybe it will be a mistake. Maybe nothing will happen, but you would have had a really good time and you would have learned some lessons you wouldn't learn any other way by staying home. Um, don't get any expensive taste. Don't get attached to having a car. Don't, I don't know. Don't promise your plants a long life. I don't know. Like just go have an adventure. And you know what, even if it wasn't, the, if it turns out not to be the right one, you got nothing to lose at your ages. Um, and and you will, you'll love it forever. You'll have stories about it forever. And it will make you better in the next job, whatever you do next. Um, and we need people like you. We need you to go out and, and still go find those corners that the people haven't even uncovered the stories yet. We don't even know the stories that are out there because nobody went there yet. There are always stories. You just have to walk around and look around and listen to people and ask the people on the ground. Um, always remember that you don't know best. It's the people who are there who know best and you listen to their stories. Um, so really, I want you to go out and have a wild and crazy life and, and enjoy it and write about it and um, have as much fun when you're my age as I'm still having. I think that's a great bit of advice to end on to go and have an adventure. And um, Terry, that's been such a fascinating session. Thank you so much for sparing Thank your time. Thank you who stuck in there. Absolutely. No, absolutely. And you guys have my email. I mean, you can get my email address. If anybody has any questions they want to ask or advice or, you know, look over a story or whatever, um, reach me on Twitter or find my, my email is terry.schultz at gmail.com. Um, Jerry or Jem can give it to you. Um, I have no problem with that. Just let me know. Hook up on LinkedIn. I don't really know what people use LinkedIn for. I don't use it adequately, I think, but um, you can always find me there um, and just ask me and, and um, I'm willing to help. That's really kind. Thank you so much. Um, right. For everyone still on the call, uh, you've got our AGM next in room one, which yeah um, can sometimes be a bit laborious, but I promise it's really, really important. And we're going to elect a new trustee and all sorts. So it's all going on. Um, oh and this is where I leave. I don't do administrative <laughs> stuff. <laughs> okay, you guys go have exciting lives and tell me how it turns out. Okay. <laughs> Thank you guys. Bye.